Uh, good, good morning uh, and welcome to the 13th meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. We have apologies from Murdo Fraser, who's moving amendments on the Transport Bill this morning. Neil Bibby may have to leave at some stage during the proceedings for the same purpose as we go through the morning. Can I just remind members to put their mobile phones, etc., into a mode we it won't interfere, and I better do the same with mine. Thank you very much. Um, the first item on our agenda this morning is to consider the F Scottish Fiscal Commission's economic and fiscal forecasts published last week to accompany the Scottish Government's medium term financial strategy. And I welcome to the meeting Dame Susan Rice, who is the Chair of the Fiscal Commission, Professor Alistair Smith, one of the Commissioners, and John Ireland, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Warmly well, welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, and I just wonder if Dame Susan Rice would like to make an opening statement. Convener, thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for inviting us to give evidence uh, again today. Uh, in addition to my uh, colleagues who are uh, here with me, I would just give apologies from our other two Commissioners, Professors Francis Breed and David Ulf, who were not able to join us this morning. Uh, I'd like to give you just a bit of an update, a generic update. Um, since we last appeared in front of you in January, the Commission completed its second year as a statutory body. I'm very pleased to say that we have now signed a memorandum of understanding with DWP on access to data on Social Security. I'm grateful to the civil servants at DWP and the Scottish Government who helped us with that. You'll remember in January that we had just then signed a formal MOU with the OBR and we're now about to sign a revised MOU with HMRC. That's all really good progress from our uh, perspective. As you know, our founding legislation requires that we're externally reviewed at the end of our second year. I'm very pleased that the OECD have agreed to carry out this review for us, along with several international experts. The review team will be in Edinburgh, in fact, next week, and I'm grateful that uh, a couple of members of this committee uh, will be meeting them on Tuesday morning, so thank you for that. As you know, we publish our forecast twice a year um, to support the medium-term financial strategy of the Scottish Government, that's in May, and also their budget in December. The latest report contains our economy, tax, and social security forecasts as usual, but what we've done a little differently this time is to put greater emphasis on an analysis of key issues facing the Scottish budget. Everyone's attention at budget time in the winter is focused on tax and spending plans for the year ahead. What's good about the summer, the most recent forecast, is that with the immediate pressure of setting a budget behind us, we can spend some time thinking about the longer term. Our forecasts look ahead over the next five financial years. We also take the opportunity of adding an additional financial year at this stage to our forecast. This time around, it was adding 2024-25. Um, in our report, we highlighted two longer-term risks to the Scottish budget. The first arises from the devolution of further Social Security benefits in April 2020, so that's uh, in less than a year. Our estimate of the spend on Social Security next year is £3.5 billion compared with the £447 million we expect to be spent this year. The forthcoming benefits are demand-led, in other words, anyone who applies and is eligible must be paid. So the government will need to be able to manage in year any difference between the forecast and the actual spend. By way of context, the government's entire spend this year on its justice portfolio, which covers police, fire, court and prison services, the entire spend in that area is £2.7 billion. So you can see that £3.5 billion is a great deal of money. What makes this trickier is that forecasting the spend on new benefits to be administered in a distinct, distinctively Scottish way and possibly around different eligibility rules is by its nature much harder in the first few years when we don't have an established baseline to work from. The second risk we highlight is the adjustments to the UK is the adjustments the UK Treasury will begin to make to the block grant, reflecting for the first time actual income tax collected. We estimate that these adjustments or reconciliations using the technical language of the fiscal framework will reduce the Scottish budget by £229 million next financial year and by £608 million the year after. The reconciliations arise from the use of two sets of forecasts at the time that the budget is set. 
our revenue forecasts and the forecasts of the block grant adjustment, which is based on OBR forecasts of receipts by the UK government. Forecasts, as we all know, are never entirely correct, but the budget has to be based on the best possible estimates of what will be raised and spent. I suspect you'll be interested in why our estimates of the reconciliations are the size they are, and we can explore that with you. Um, at this point, I think it's worth saying just two things. First, as we said in December, considering the OBR's track record uh, over time, we may see errors as large as 3.3% or around 530 million pounds in a Scottish context. That was just to give you a sense of, of what uh, might evolve over time. Second, at the moment, our analysis of reconciliations, at the moment, our analysis of reconciliations is based on our and the OBR's most recent forecasts during the summer, um, this summer, income tax outturn data for 2017-18 will be published. In our September evaluation report, forecast evaluation report, we intend to present a detailed analysis of the actual reconciliations, which I think will be a fruitful discussion then. Returning to the Scottish budget, what's probably most important for the government is their decisions regarding how any volatility uh, in that number is managed. The government can borrow, can use its reserves to help deal with these reconciliations. It also may have to consider adjusting its spending plans. Finally, I'd like to turn to the prospects for the Scottish economy. In December, I said that Brexit was at the front of our minds. That has continued to be the case. When we started working on our forecast back in March, we thought hard about how we would deal with Brexit. Our forecast is based, as it was in December, on a broad assumption of an orderly negotiated exit from the EU. We now obviously assume that exit will be in October rather than in March. The terms on which the UK may leave the EU are still highly uncertain, and we've made a number of broad rush assumptions to capture a range of possible outcomes. A no-deal exit is not captured in our central assumptions, but is a significant downside risk to our forecasts. We followed the many twists and turns on Brexit as we put our forecast together. We finalized our approach at the beginning of last month when the government needed our final forecast to do their work. While things have moved on since then, most recently the Prime Minister's resignation, we still believe that our Brexit assumptions are a reasonable basis for our forecasts. So thank you very much for your attention. That was to give you an overview, and we now welcome any questions or thoughts you have. Well, thank you, Dame Susan, for the... Your, your opening statement. Um, you, you rightly mentioned the, the forecast of income tax reconciliations, and the, I think we need to get into that area first. And something's puzzling me about this, because despite Brexit, um, slower projected population growth in Scotland compared with the rest of the UK, both these elements out largely out with the control of Holyrood, the Scottish economy is still growing. Unemployment in Scotland is lower than the rest of the UK. Our tax take also continues to grow, and yet we end up through the forecast of the income tax reconciliations with less money. Now, to me, that's not how a normal economy would work, uh, and, th and there's something in this that we need to understand a bit more, and that's pretty clear to me. So for the benefit of the committee, and those who might be watching the proceedings and who are interested, perhaps you could let us know from a Scottish Fiscal Commission's perspective, why is, why is this happening? So, really important question, and we have spent uh, a lot of time um, sort of considering how to articulate a response to that. Alistair, can I ask you maybe to kick off? Yes, well, I'll, I'll have a go at that. Uh, the, the reconciliations process is a very complicated one with, with lots of moving parts and it's very hard to keep your eye on getting all the moving car parts lined up in the right way at, at any point, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. The, the key starting point, as Susan said, is that when the budget is set, and let's take the 2018-19 the budget uh, as an example because that's where the, big recon the biggest reconciliation is, when that budget was set in 2017, it had to be set on the basis of forecasts, our forecasts of income tax revenue and the OBR's forecasts of um, the UK economy, which feed into the, the block grant adjustment. Uh, and 
as you said, convener, that we'd expect with the Scottish economy growing, Scottish income tax would be growing, and that's indeed the case. We'd also expect that with the UK economy growing, that that would feed into the calculation of the block grant adjustment. So we were forecasting a growth of Scottish income tax revenue. The OBR was forecasting a growth of UK income tax revenue, and both of those forecasts went into the, the calculation of the budget. So what we're now having to do, or and, and as Susan emphasised, we're still just looking at what we expect to happen when we find out what the outcomes are and the first income tax outturn uh, for 2017-18 will appear uh, in July, I think, the 2018-19 one in, in July next year. We're looking at what, what seems likely to be the case with those outturns. Now, it still is the case. Scottish income tax has, we expect, will have grown over this period. UK income tax will have grown over this period. But Scottish income tax has grown slightly more slow, at a slightly slower rate than we expected. UK income tax has grown, looks to have grown at quite, quite a lot of faster rate than was went into the, the BGA forecast. So the re reconciliation comes about not, it's not really about the performance of the economies, the, the UK economy and the Scottish economy. It's really about how accurate the forecasts were, and in particular, whether the two, whether the two, the, and I use the word errors carefully, all for, no, no forecasts are accurate. Whether, if the forecast errors on both sides were the same, there would be no reconciliation. So it's not even, you know, do you have big forecast errors? If we had the same forecast errors as the OBR, then there would be no problem. It's when our forecast adjustments are out of line that the, the reconciliation is needed. So it's not really about the performance of the Scottish economy as such. It's about how what adjustments in the forecasts uh, now seem likely to be appropriate. Yeah, but th that, yeah, I understand all that but that doesn't actually explain why we're losing uh, money in, uh, as a result of the forecast income reconciliation. Is it not right, though, in terms of what the OBR projected in their figures, that much of that additional growth that was unexpected and higher than they, that they thought it was going to be was a result of increased earnings um, in, the rest, in, in the rest of the UK? Yes, that you're... you're, you're uh, you're absolutely right. The, 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 si the single biggest factor in the size of the reconciliation is that UK tax revenue has risen faster than had been anticipated when the, the budget was set. That's, the, that's the, the, the most important comparison. Faster growth of UK tax revenue than forecast, whereas Scottish tax revenue has grown uh, just slightly slower than forecast, but not not uh, the, the gap there is, isn't very big. It's the it's the growth of UK tax revenue that has been that has given rise to the big adjustment. So the the the, the block grant adjustment is bigger than um, than was forecast two years ago. So in our budget report in January, we began to explore some of this, and there were questions from myself and from Adam and from Murdo unfortunately he can't be with us today because he's away at another committee uh, and the and the report we pr produced we suggested that there was evidence that the differences in income tax growth may be due to that disproportionate level of higher taxpayers in the rest of the UK compared to Scotland so if that's the case to me does that not suggest then that there's a flaw in the way the fiscal framework operates and we need to address this as part of the review of the fiscal framework when, when that comes in 2021. Because otherwise, we're going to be in a competition here we cannot win. Well, in the end, it's not for the Fiscal Commission to, to uh, make judgments about how the fiscal framework should be changed. I mean, that's a matter for the parliaments and, and the governments. Um, but it's... I'd also say it's not. It's, it's suppose it were the case, as and you're you're quite right, convener. The likeliest 
single explanation of this issue is that in the rest of the UK there are a higher concentration of high rate taxpayers and that the recent growth of UK income tax revenue has been concentrated in high rate taxpayers. So it's not just the, the distribution but the fact that the, the growth of UK tax revenue has disproportionately seems to have come from that group and in our Forecast evaluation report in September, we'll be looking at this more closely. Um, but it's not, I, I wouldn't say that that's a fundamental flaw, because had we and the OBR anticipated that two years ago in setting our forecasts, we would have, we would have said, well, in forecasting the growth of Scottish income tax revenue, we have to take account of the distribution of Scottish taxpayers, and in forecasting the, the, the growth of UK income tax revenue, which will go into the block grant adjustment, the OBR will take account of uh, the, the distribution of UK taxpayers. None of us uh, were aware that the growth of income tax revenue in that two-year period would be so strongly affected by distributional issues. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, we would have done different forecasts. Does that mean there's a fundamental flaw? No. Uh, had we known about this, the budget would have been set on that basis, and we then wouldn't have a reconciliation. Scotland would have had a smaller budget two years ago, and we wouldn't need a, a, a reconciliation now. It's not a flaw. It, first of all, it's not a flaw in the... In the I, 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 and what you've been doing. No, no, no. I, 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 and, and it's not necessarily, a, uh, uh, having said it's not for us to pronounce on the fiscal framework, I shouldn't say it's not a flaw in the fiscal framework. But there's no particular reason to think of it as a flaw in the fiscal framework. Those sorts, of, those sorts of adjustments are the normal business of forecasting. Thinking about the, the distribution of high rate taxpayers in Scotland versus the UK is, you know, is a, a twist that I don't think either the OBR or us would feel that that was a terrible mistake to have made. It's, it's a twist that, with the benefit of hindsight, we might have, have done a slightly better job. But that's the normal business of forecasting. Two years on, with any set of forecasts, you find things that you could have done better. And the scale of the corrections here, and I think this is the most important lesson the most important message from this, the scale of the forecast corrections here is not out of line with what you expect to arise from, from putting together the forecasts of two forecasters doing a, a pretty good job of forecasting. Nobody's going to get it right. And the message is that the, the, the Scottish government has got to be ready to deal with reconciliations on this scale hopefully not £600 million every year, hopefully not always negative, there will be some years in which it's positive and negative, but this scale of adjustment is not out of line with what you'd expect with the, the, the way the framework is set up. I'm sorry I've talked no, no, too that, much, but yeah, it's no, but a complicated with, with issue. With all that being said, it still means, um, in, in terms of the paper you produced, a £229 million problem for the Scottish budget, which, while it might not be much in forecasting, in terms of that, it's a lot of money at the end of the day, and uh, we really need to get and be, get really underneath why this is happening. And if there's a a structural problem that exists in the UK in salary terms and earnings between what happens in Scotland with a number of additional and higher rate taxpayers that we have compared with the rest of the UK, this might not be a one-off. Except that if that is the issue, then it's something that will will feed into our forecasts in the future. We learn, you know, forecast errors don't reproduce themselves because the forecasters learn, uh, and we we would uh, we would take that into account in our future forecasts. I think it might be helpful to think to separate these two things out. That what Scotland will will get through this process does depend upon that structural difference between the, the rest of the UK and Scotland. You're absolutely right. But the reconciliation issue isn't that. The reconciliation as Alist issue, is, as Alistair says, is about comparative forecast accuracy. So you're right, there's a structural issue, perhaps, between the labour markets in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And in the end, it will wash out and that will affect how much Scotland gets. 
but it doesn't at all influence this reconciliation issue at all. That's to do with forecasting. Yeah, but if we take the baseline and where we started, that means that from the from from now on in, we're going to be 229, 22, 229, 229 million pounds out every year from now on in, because of where we started from. No, we're uh, going to be 229 down in 2017-18, yeah, looking at the forecast for 2017. But if it's structural, how is that going to change? Uh, because the the 20 uh, the, because this, in this autumn, we're going to be, we, the, the governments will be setting the budget for 2020-21. And in setting the 2021 budget, I imagine that we will all be aware of the implications of the distribution issue for our income tax forecasts and for the BGA forecasts. So uh, the... So those factors will feed into the forecasts. Now, that will that may mean that the forecast that the the twenty the twenty 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 one budget is less favourable than it would have been without this. But it's no longer a reconciliation issue. If, if we get the forecast right, it's it's in the budget. Okay, let me just. Oh, so I'm, so I'm just. I'm, I know Adam wants to come in in, in this one. I want to just burrow down a bit further because when we looked at the HMRC's forecast for the number of additional and higher rate uh, taxpayers. The forecast that you built your own um, modelling on was 18,000 additional rate taxpayers. The actual number turned out, once we got the outturned figure from HMRC, to be 13,300. So if these 18,000 who were in the system to begin with were to, say, have a 3% increase in their wages, that's a heck of a lot more money than 13,300 additional rate taxpayers having an increase in their wages of 3%. So inevitably, built in from the beginning, we've got a problem here. Yeah, but as Alistair says, this, the way it manifests itself is in, that will be shown up in our forecasts in future. The, the issue, I, I think it's really important to separate these two things out, that there is a structural issue here, you're, you're absolutely right, but it isn't manifested through the reconciliation issue. So the structural issue that you need to, to, to worry about, in a sense, is to do with the whole issue of devolution of income tax, which is not our bag, it's your bag. But that, that's where the, 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 the structural issue that you're thinking about comes. In terms of how the reconciliation operates, it's about forecasting and relative forecasting accuracy. And both the OBR forecast, which is going to, feed, to determine the block grant adjustment, and our forecasts both take account of the, the, the outturn data, and they're both adjusted downwards by 550 million to reflect that. So there's no impact of that outturn data and the reduced number of income tax payers on reconciliation. There's no net effect at all. But you're right, there is a structural issue to do with the devolution of income tax. But as I say, that's not the Fiscal Commission's. Yeah, okay. Could I just add a, a footnote to that, um, which is uh, that these reconciliation numbers, as Alistair said, will likely go up and down. They will certainly vary from year to year. Um, and so you have a budget which is real um, based on forecast numbers which will change and evolve. And so the government will need to think, as I think I said in my comments, about how to manage, how we manage our budgets at home. Uh, you know, how do we allow for variability so that they can pay out in real term times benefits or uh, make expenditure uh, when those numbers will vary over time? That's another challenge. Okay, I, I, I recognise I've been dominating a fair bit of this discussion and I'd, I'd like to go further, but I, I, I look, to be fair to others, I've got to let them in. Adam. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I want to ask two sets of follow-up questions to the, uh, still in the same area that um, the, the Convener's been ex exploring with you. The first is about earnings and the second is about um, borrowing and something that Professor Smith just said. So earnings first. Last time you were in front of us, um, five months ago or so, you were um, uh, quizzed um, by Alexander Burnett and uh, others um, uh, quite heavily about some very eye-catching numbers that you had then forecast in terms of the projected increase in Scotland of additional and higher rate taxpayers, which you said would lead to very significantly increased income tax revenues accruing to the Scottish Government uh, in the forecast period um, from now looking forward five years um, 
uh, for looking forward for five years. Do you stand by those forecasts? Because they caught a number of us uh, as being, I think, quite surprising uh, last time you were in front of us. And now what you're telling us um, is that uh, the opposite seems to be the case and that uh, income tax uh, revenues are not likely to increase in Scotland as quickly uh, as had previously been forecast because of some differential between the income distribution in uh, Scotland compared with the rest of the UK. It, it, just to go back to, your, to what you said at the very start, I think in December what we, we, we said was that the, um, on the basis of the outturn data, we had adjusted um, our view of where people sat in the distribution, and we said that there was an increase in the number of higher rate taxpayers. We also, I think, said that because where they were positioned in that distribution, so they were positioned very, very near the threshold, that it didn't lead to such a proportionate and dramatic increase in income tax revenue. So I think the paradox we were trying to explain last time we appeared was um, an increase in the number of higher rate taxpayers, which was, was, was very dramatic over time, but that income tax revenues didn't increase by so much. They did increase, but so that, that's... I, I understand that. The question yeah. is, do you stand by those forecasts? Do you, do you, is it still your view as a Scottish Fiscal Commission, that the number of additional and higher rate income taxpayers in Scotland is likely to grow, as you just described yes. it, Mr Ireland, dramatically over that forecast period? The, the, numbers, um, the numbers of higher rate taxpayers, um, which we, we have published, we haven't put them in our summary report, but we do publish them on the web, and those numbers are consistent with the numbers that we used in December, yes. Do you stand by those forecasts? We stand by, yeah. we stand by the, those, those forecasts. So can you just remind the committee what those forecasts are based on? Because they still, I think, uh, you know, uh, there are, you know, forgive me, but I think there are a number of us who find, who have a degree of scepticism about the, about the amount that those forecasts, that those numbers can really be trusted. So the way, the way in which the income tax forecast is constructed is that we have um, a sample survey um, of the individual tax records throughout the UK with geographical sort of identified. So we can identify the Scottish taxpayers. So this is, this is a large sample of the administrative data. And what we have done with that, that sample is we've taken the outturn data that we had for 2016-17, and that gave us the number of taxpayers in each band. And we adjusted the number of people, the number of those tax records, so they reflected exactly the... Um, the distribution we saw in the outturn data. So, in other words, that you know, you can be confident that it, um, we reflect in the outturn data, which is the best data that we have in the sort of the, the micro data that we use to, to do our forecast. So, we can be confident about that. And then, what we do is we apply our, our macroeconomic forecast, the growth rates from that, um, to the individual tax records, and then we can see where people lie over time in the income distribution sorry, in the income tax distribution, where they're distributed between tax bands, because that's a purely mechanical thing. And that's, in essence, how the forecasts are generated. Um, this time round, we, we've, we've had another um, sample taken of um, the administrative record, so we have another year's worth of data. Um, we've again adjusted that, so it reflects exactly the outturn data that we have for 16, 17 in terms of numbers. So that's why, in a sense, we stand by um, forecasts. The, the, the impact of those changes, has been, there's been some changes of that new data, and it hasn't been dramatic. The thing which is driving our tax, income tax forecast this time around, um, which has caused the difference, is the improvement in our macroeconomic forecast. Earnings are doing particularly well at the moment, um, and that feeds through into our macroeconomic forecast, and that has generated the new income tax forecasts. I hasten to add that... Um, the, the growth in the income tax forecast this time around is not as dramatic as you might take from the earnings because we've made an adjustment to account for some UK policies. We've got better information on how UK policies have been affecting Scottish taxpayers from the OBR, and that adjustment for pension auto-enrolment auto in effect cancels out most of the increase in the income tax forecast. So there have been two net movements. That's helpful just to get all of that on the record. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I want to move to uh, um, the, the second set of questions I, I, I wanted to follow up. Um, with you on the basis of what the convener was uh, asking. Um, uh, and Professor Smith, if I got this down right, I think you said in answer to one of the convener's questions a few moments ago that the Scottish Government has to be ready to deal with this scale of adjustment. We're talking about a billion pounds 
over the course of three fiscal years um, of, uh, of uh, income tax reconciliation adjustment, which, which you say is not out of line with or not out of kilter with the ordinary business of, uh, of comparative forecast uh, inaccuracy. So the, the, key, the key point that you're making there is that the Scottish Government needs to manage the nation's finances such that it is ready to deal with this scale of adjustment. This is going to be a normal feature of um, uh, fiscal events and uh, financial planning uh, in, in Scotland uh, under the current um, fiscal framework. So um, given that you have said at paragraphs 367 and 368 of your report published last week that the Scottish Government isn't going to be able uh, to deal with this level of adjustment through the use of its borrowing powers because so much of the credit card, to use the colloquial, has already been maxed out, does that not suggest that the current stewardship of the nation's finances has not been sufficiently prudent to deal with this ordinary, usual, routine scale of, um, uh, of adjustment? The, 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 first of all, I, I confirm what I said earlier. This uh, scale of reconciliation is, is, is of a general order of magnitude that shouldn't be surprising and that, that the Scottish Government will need to, to plan for. Hopefully, Sometimes it'll be positive rather than negative. Um, the, this, the government's scope for dealing with those adjustments without uh, having to cut spending or raise taxes comes from its drawing on uh, the, the Scotland Reserve, uh, where it can draw a maximum of 250 million a year, and from resource borrowing, a maximum, I think, of 300 million a year. Uh, so it's not, it's not so much an issue of maxing out the credit card, it's that the credit, card has got annual, the credit cards have got annual limits on them. And even if, uh, however much money is in the Scotland Reserve, if only 250 can be drawn down any one year, that's the, 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 the annual limit. Um, and if, if we have to face an adjustment of 600 million in in a year's time, and that's at the moment just an estimate, then you know, it's just a matter of simple arithmetic to add 250 and 300 and say it, it doesn't add up to 600. Uh, so, so, which is why Susan said the, the, if things turn out this way, the government will need to look at adjusting expenditure or raising revenue to deal, to deal with it. It won't need to look at that. It will have to do it, won't it? I mean, that's what you say at 368 quite graphically. This will mean that the Scottish Government will have to adjust its spending plans or increase taxes. Those are, those are your words. Can, you, can I just draw you out on what, what, you mean, what you mean by that? Just add to what Alistair said Please, before yeah. and, and respond to something that you said. Just on borrowing, it's, it, there are two sorts of borrowing. There's resource borrowing and capital borrowing. The government is using its capital borrowing, and it will, in the future, max out if it continues the way it's going. It has yet to use its resource borrowing powers. So it's resource borrowing which, it, which you can use to deal with reconciliations. And so it has 300 million, which it can use, so 300 million on the credit card, as Alistair would say, which it can use to deal with reconciliations. It can use 300 million a year. The issue is it has to repay that borrowing over three to five years. So you can't run up a big credit card bill. You know, you, you, you would, but there is scope there for 300 million borrowing a year. Also on the reserves, um, Alistair said that you can use 250. That's true. You can use 250 of reserves. But these, again, are resource reserves. And at the moment, there's only about 146 million in the kitty. So it's um, just to modify a little what Alistair said, it's more optimistic perhaps on borrowing than you, you might have thought, slightly less optimistic than the 250 because there's only 146 at the moment in reserves. That's very helpful, but, it, but, but I mean, just to underscore the point, you, you say, and again, these are your words, 367 of the report, um, th th these figures combined will not be sufficient to manage the income tax reconciliations that you're currently forecasting. So that will mean that the Scottish Government will have to adjust its spending plans or increase taxes. Is that, is that right? Well, well, except that. I, th uh, I think we say w would uh, because these, these reconciliations that we have in our report are still forecasts. Uh, so, if, yeah, so if we end up with reconciliations of 250, 249 and 608, then the wood becomes a will, yes. And we, we, have, we have spelled that out in our report, and I don't think there's anything to add to the words in our report, which are quite clear. Thank you very much. Now, I've got quite a few people here in supplementary. I think, Tom, you were wanting in here. 
Speaker and good morning, Commissioners. Um, I just want to follow up and, and clarify my understanding. And the reality is there, there are two credit cards. There's a, a capital credit card which has been used, but then there's the resource credit card, and the government hasn't even taken a ballpoint pen to go and sign the back of it yet. It's not been used at all. So that resource uh, capacity is still there to be used. My understanding is the resource capacity is there to be used, and they haven't used all the, the, the capital, but they are using it at a, at a pretty quick rate, yeah. Now, the element of that is, if it's, I can say it's up to £600 million a year, £500 million for in-cash management. That's what would be deployed to manage the demand-driven expenditure, such as Social Security. Is that correct? Sorry. The in-cash, the £500 million a year for in-cash management within the resource capacity for borrowing, that would be used to meet um, demand-driven spending such as Social Security. The reason I ask that question is you make forecasts upon Social Security and there's an expectation next year of £3.5 billion. Is that correct? So on the Social Security, yes. That, and because the Social Security budget will increase and it's demand-led, there will be a need for sort of in-year cash management and there's, there okay. are facilities to do that, yes. And can you just clarify your confidence in the forecast of 3.5 billion pounds for next year because I appreciate it's very difficult because these powers are only coming online. And I think it's important to be exactly clear what that represents. So that represents um, our forecast of the social security benefits that Scotland will have executive authority for. So in other words DWP will minister them on DWP rules, they're not Scottish rules. Um, so it's a, it's a broad brush first attempt to forecast what the, what the, what the bill will be um, on continuing UK rules. Um, if there's changes in eligibility or there's changes in um, how the, the, the benefits are administered as they are taken over by Social Security Scotland, of course that forecast will change. We don't take account of that. Mr. Islands, I want to get a sense of how confident you are. Given with the best start grant, there was a forecast, I believe, of 4,000 for the full year, but there was 4,000 applicants on oh. the first day. And what I'm trying to understand is how confident the Commission is in that forecast so I can understand whether the in-year cash management resource borrowing powers are sufficient. So are you able to say how confident you are in that 3.5 billion figure? Are we going to, because we've obviously seen very significant forecast reconciliations over income tax, I'm keen to get a sense of what the potential error is in social security forecasting. We wouldn't put any sort of quantitative error bands around that. I, I think the words that I'm using in saying this is an initial forecast um, based on sort of UK rules um, and you know, forecasting new social security benefits um, as, we, as, as has been shown in the sense with the with the, um, the, the, the first one which came along is, is difficult. So um, it's I would expect there to be some significant forecast error there. Um, I couldn't say which way, but I, I'm, it, it, it's a pretty uncertain forecast, I think, is, is how you, I would put what, it. Can you quantify significant as a, p a potential percentage? No, I, I, I don't think we're in a position to do that, but, but we, we are, and it's one of the highlights of our report, that we think that a social security budget of 3.5 million, uh, billion, <laughs> 3.5 billion, with uh, the possibility of eligibility changes coming into that as, as it gets fully devolved, is, is a sum of money with a high degree of risk. That's one of the highlights of a report, we're drawing attention to the fact that there is a very significant fiscal risk in this, so we're agreeing with you on that. Putting numbers on it is hard. Is it impossible? We, I think you could, <laughs> what you could do, do, what you could do, and I'm not going to do it here on the back of an envelope or a pocket calculator, what you could do is you could look at the OBR's forecasting record for social security benefits and then apply that sort of you know, average error that the OBR has made to our 3.5 billion forecast. So you could get a ballpark figure. Um, we haven't done that, um, and I'm not going to, as I say, I'm not going to do it this morning. Okay, I won't, I won't push any further on that. Um, with regards to income tax forecasts, I, I appreciate this is a, an art as much as a science, and it's developing, and it's still very early days. But what are your expectations that we could be seeing in the future um, 
forecast errors, and I appreciate there's, there's two parties at play here, both yourself and the OBR, but what's the possibility of further reconciliations in the region of £600 million pounds being required? Is that something that we should become accustomed to and expect, or should in general be expect as the years progress and more information and data becomes available, that we would be expecting far less margins of error? We have had a look at the OBR's track record in, in forecasting income tax. And Susan mentioned at the start that um, about 3.3%, I think, um, is their sort of average absolute error. So you can expect um, that sort of magnitude, which roughly does come to about 500 million. We also saw that in the OBR's track record, what you get is a pattern of sort of consistent errors. You get a positive error, a positive error, a positive error, and then perhaps it will flip. So on average, you'd expect the, the, the errors to, to be zero because you know, forecasters don't make systematic errors. They just make errors you know, which are then corrected. But what we ha observed in the OBR's forecasting record was consistently um, you know, an error of one sign, an error of the same sign, an error of the same sign. So they, they persist over time. So, and what we're forecasting here is three negative reconciliations. Now, I'm not going to promise, but I would hope that at some point that flips into the other way around. Just to, yes, certainly, Professor. Well, and just to add to the, the complications of what John has said, we, the reconciliations, as we've been explaining, arise not from one set of forecast errors, but from two sets of forecast errors, which which com complicates the issue further. It's not it's not what sort of forecast errors might we reasonably expect from the Fiscal Commission? What forecast errors should we reasonably expect from the OBR? But how often? will we err in the same direction so there isn't a reconciliation problem? And how often will we err in different directions so our two errors put together create a, a bigger reconciliation rather than a smaller one? And, and without really wanting to muddy the uh, waters or the thought process, um, there will be other reconciliations. It's not just about income tax. So over time, we'll see reconciliations in relation to Social Security and some of our devolved taxes. So it is a very complicated <coughs> landscape. I appreciate it can go either way, and in the long run, it should effectively cancel each other out. But 550 million is not um, an unrealistic number. I think when we I'll answer the question in a slightly different way, when we saw it was 500 million, 600 million, we weren't surprised. Because the final point I wish to make, convenient, is just that the, the, the theoretical maximum the Scottish government would have to address that is, is 550 million. That's taking 300 million of resource and 250 million of reserve, but that's contingent upon having enough reserve, and the resource is also contingent upon that's within a 600 million pounds cap, of which within that there's 500 million that can be spent for in-year cash management. So if money is getting used to address social security forecast errors in-year, my understanding is that would reduce the amount of money and from resource borrowing available to address income tax forecast errors. So the potential of actually even having £550 million to address an income tax for error, uh, forecast error is fairly limited in itself. So uh, that was my the reason for my line of question. I appreciate you can um, comment you know, upon that's applicability to the fiscal framework, but just it clearly raises a lot of questions about going into the fiscal framework review. If we can be in a situation where £550 million of forecast error is not going to be um, out of, uh, it's not going to be abnormal or unusual, then that exceeds really what's available for the Scottish Government to, to meet that. So I think because we can't comment, and it's not our job to comment on the fiscal framework, we, 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 we took the approach that Mr Mackay took in his statement, saying, well, here are the rules, and what are the implications of the rules? And the implication of the rules is that if these reconciliations turn out to be as, as we say they may be, um, then there's a, and the need to adjust the spending or more taxes. But, but just as a matter of fact, we can agree with you that the Scottish Government's borrowing powers, as set in our, uh, out in our report, are relatively modest, set against the scale of possible reconciliations. Just as factual matter, that's a... And that's something that's independent of policy and government decisions. That's just based upon how much information can be provided through forecasting. Uh, these borrowing powers aren't enough necessarily to meet forecast error. <coughs> Is that fair to say, just as a statement of fact? I, I would just stick with the statement of fact that I, I okay. give you a moment. Thank you. Ago, rather than you. trying Patrick. to elaborate. <laughs> Patrick. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, apologies for, for sticking with this, this area a, a bit further. Um, 
the, the, the scale of the numbers that we're talking about have been described as normal, but it, it does seem to me that a, a normal government would face uncertainty from one set of income tax forecasts rather than two conducted separately, perhaps under separate methodologies, which potentially compound each other. So uh, I think normal is, is perhaps um, a questionable word to use. Just in, in terms of the scale of the 2018-19 tax year, which is the, the, the biggest element of, of what we're talking about, um, I appreciate, I think we all appreciate that we wouldn't expect you to comment on the policy choices that a Scottish government would face if, if that is the figure, the 600 million uh, plus that we're, that we're talking about. But Susan Rice still described this as an estimate. Uh, to what extent is this based on actual tax data for the 1819 year as opposed to still being an estimate? If it is still an estimate, when will we know what the final figure is? Because you'll appreciate that not for you to comment on, but for us to consider, there are huge po political implications from a reconciliation of that scale on a budget that's being voted on in this parliament two months before a Scottish general election. Okay. Um, so the, the, the simple answer is you will not know that particular year's outturn this July, but you'll know it next July. So that's the straightforward answer. But obviously the information that we have in the numbers that we'll see this July will help us refine the estimates. Also the information, the real-time information that HMLC collect and we see about pay-as-you-earn receipts um, at the Scottish level um, also you know, feeds into our forecast. So there is some real data, if you wish, in, in our forecasts already. Over time that will improve and the next big improvement will be in July when we get um, the next outturn data, but you won't see the outturn data for this particular year until July afterwards. So you would say that with the data we have at the moment, the data you're working on at the moment, you are narrowing down the amount of uncertainty in that, or is it, is it still, should we still consider it a forecast rather than... Oh, it's definitely a forecast. It's definitely a forecast, but as we get more data, and as we get RTI data, the real-time data, yeah. as we get the outturn data, and as um, a couple of months ago we got the, the sample of administrative records, our, our, the, hard data, the, the, the data element of that forecast is increased and the forecasting element is reduced. So it's, it's a gradual process. It's not black and white, but we are certainly getting more information and more hard data is going to the forecast over time. But there will always be, at least as far as we know, the 15-month lag between the end of the uh, fiscal year and the publication of the outturn data uh, for income tax. The hard number finally will be known basically in the middle of the summer recess uh, a couple of months before the Scottish Government has to publish uh, a budget for 21-22. Thank you. That should you note. James, and then Molly. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you, convener. Uh, I think what's making the committee nervous is the, the way the forecasts uh, are changing. Uh, and the fact that we're in a position where uh, the, the set of forecasts paint a more bleak position than previous forecasts. So I'm keen just to take one year and to get an understanding of that year in terms of how the, the numbers have moved. So in terms of this uh, budget year 1920, um, from the position where the budget was set, uh, we're now potentially, based on these forecasts, £188 million worse off. Now, the reason for that, obviously, is that the, the forecast revenues uh, that you've set for the Scottish Government tax revenue have increased uh, by £20 million. However, uh, they, that has been offset by the OBR forecast of the block grant adjustment, uh, which they have, they have set a, an increase of £208 million. So I'm just interested in, in those particular movements. So first of all, in terms of the 20 million increase in uh, forecast increase in Scottish government ta income tax revenue, what what kind of drove that change from earlier in the year? So I, I think you're looking at um, Table 4.4, um, which gives the change in our income tax forecast. And as I said um, earlier, when I was responding to Mr. Tompkins' question, the improvement in the 
in, in earnings um, caused us to increase our forecast by 150 million in that year. And the, the big negative of 127 million um, in that forecast, though those two figures offset each other, was due to us having more information um, about UK policies and their effect on Scotland. So after talking to the OBR, um, who, and HMRC, who, who are responsible for estimating the effect of these UK policies, we took 127 million off our forecast to reflect how pension enrolment actually was, pension auto enrolment was actually working. There were other changes, um, other UK policy changes, added 10 million to the forecast. Um, we also had the new micro data I was talking about earlier, which knocked 30 million off the data. So in all, that movement of 20 million, that increase in 20 million in the forecast, was primarily driven by an improvement in our economic forecast, driving it up, and then a reduction due to our taking better account of UK policy in Scotland. Just in terms of the, the pension enrolment, obviously it was known back when the budget was, was set that you know, that was going to come into play. What information ca came to light that uh, resulted in you factoring in a reduction? Okay. Um, so what happens here is when, when the policy um, is first set, the OBR um, publish a set of policy costings. Now, one of the problems with this published policy set of policy costings is that when their policy costing changes, um, it isn't reflected in the publication. They never revise the publication. So it's very hard for us to track exactly how HMRC costings for the OBR change. So what we rely upon is conversations with the OBR, and the conversations that we had be with the OBR before Christmas um, indicated that there was some change happening, and we took, tried to take account of it then, but the subsequent conversations we had, conversations we had after Christmas made it clear that they were again changing their costing, and we needed to change ours too. So basically, as we spoke to the OBR, we got more insight into how HMRC costings for the UK were changing, and we took those on board. So as soon as we had the information, we included it in our forecast. And that, that's how it works. We, 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 we you know, change our forecast to reflect UK policy a great deal. It just happens that this was a particularly big one. But it's the same process of so continually taking the public information initially and then conversations with the OBR as they tell us how these things have moved. Okay, so I mean, just in terms of the OBR side of it, that uh, increase in their forecast of the Blanc Grant adjustment position of it going up by £208 million. What, what, was the, what was the OBR's basis for that? That's, that's a... Do you want no, that, that was a very different issue. So this, this, that was the issue that we were talking about at, at, at the opening of the meeting. So what was happening, in, in essence, is when the OBI made their original forecast, they had quite a low growth, growth rate for UK tax revenue. And as they saw how UK tax rates were, tax takes were increasing over time, and in part due to the higher earners in, in the rest of the UK, they revised their growth rates upwards. So the movement in the block grant adjustment was dealt with, that, that sort of came through... Um, a year or so, or two years ago, about a year or so ago, it was um, it was very much a much bigger adjustment than that. It's not related to the policy costings at all. Yeah, but this this two hundred and eight million pounds figure, this has changed from when the budget was set. So, what what new information has come to light for the OBR to change that in quite a short period of time? Just a continuation, as John was saying, of of what we've seen already with UK tax revenue. UK tax revenues have been surprisingly buoyant and the surprises are, are, are still coming. So that's, that, that adjustment of 208 million reflect, reflects continued growth in UK tax revenue, probably, as we were talking about earlier, concentrated at the top end of the taxpayer distribution. Okay. So, so on that. Just before I come to Willie, sorry Willie. I just wanted to just again try to bottom some of that out. If we're agreed there's that structural issue you in there, and in your evidence, it's now clear that there's a risk that the UK tax base is growing more strongly than the Scottish tax base for 2017-18 and for 2018-19, and that may be likely to continue. If that's the case, 
What's the main drivers in that difference? What's um, well, I think it's it's worth emphasising that the the all of these tax adjustments with income tax devolution are uh, start off with a base in 2016 and 17, so that the the block grant adjustment for 2016 and 17 is set equal to Scottish income tax revenue. And when that when we had the outturn of 2016 and 17, uh, that adjusted for um, the fact that there were fewer higher rate taxpayers in Scotland than proportionally in, in the, 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 the rest of the UK. What we've seen in the last two years, apparently, is that income growth has been stronger at the top end of the income distribution. Uh, now, whether that's a permanent feature of the economy, we don't know. It, it, that's just something that has happened in the last two years. It might well reverse. There's no, there's no law that. I mean, it's a, it, it may be a, fe it's, it's a feature. It seems to be a feature of the structure of the Scottish economy that Scotland has fewer high rate taxpayers. But, why? but whether the income at the top end of the income distribution is going to grow faster than the rest of the national income, there's no reason to suppose that that's yeah. going to be a permanent feature. Yeah, but, but why is it? Why, uh, why have income? I mean, if you think of the kinds of people who, are, uh, and it's not just people who, are, who are just into the higher rate taxpayer, it's the highest paying taxpayers. You know, why are the, why have the income of chief chief executives, of um, commercial lawyers? Uh, of uh, partners in, in international accountancy firms, why have their incomes been rising faster in the last two years than the incomes of uh, the rest of, of people? Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a big question that we could spend hours speculating about. The important thing is there's no particular reason to suppose that that's going to be a phenomenon that's going to continue. Can I just add an underpin as well to the differences in, in growth and income tax? And we've mentioned these things in the past, which is that the um, working age population in Scotland is not growing um, in the same rate as we see in the rest of the UK. The overall population is not growing here in, in, to the, the same extent. So these may be smaller effects, but that, that affects how much income is being drawn because our income tax is based on actual earnings income here in Scotland. So it's it's those demographic features as well. Yeah, I understand. I, I, I'm going to come to Alexander soon on that, but I think Willie's still got a question in the area we're in. But, yeah. uh, but, but I'll just say to you, though, if we don't know whether these factors in terms of salary at a higher level are going to continue or not into the future, we better start finding out because otherwise this is going to have a potential dramatic effect for some time and the, the difference in the, the rest of the UK economy compared with the Scottish economy. Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. And my question is really about forecasting in general, but I wonder if you could clarify for me something that's already been said for my simple mind, if you don't mind. I think you said that the biggest influencer, the biggest factor on what might impact the Scottish budget, it's not the performance of the Scottish economy, it's not the relative performance in tax take between Scotland and our UK, it's about the comparative forecast accuracy. I think that's the words John used. Is, it, is, it, is that the main factor that, that leads to these reconciliation figures, the forecast? No, no, no I, I think that's n not, uh, if it was me who said that, it's not what I meant to say. Uh, the, the reconciliation issue arises because of, of forecasts being, being out the two forecasts being out of line in a different way. That's where the reconciliation problem comes away. But where, where, where I would agree with the convener is that if the underlying issue is an issue about gr income growing in different parts of the distribution at different rates, then once the forecasters get a grip on that, it's built into the forecast and, and it stops showing up as a reconciliation issue but it doesn't mean that the issue has gone away. It would then be built into our forecast. And if it is indeed the case that the that Scottish income tax revenue, for structural reasons, is going to grow more slowly than UK income tax revenue, then 
that, that, that's an objective problem for income tax. For the, that's a problem for the Scottish budget. It's showing up as reconciliations at the moment because the forecasters didn't anticipate that. Once we start anticipating it, it'll be built into the budget and into the forecast. It doesn't mean it, it goes away. It just pops up somewhere different, pops up in the budget instead of in the reconciliations. Uh, it, it was actually John that said that phrase, because I've written it down, and you said that, John, to ask you specifically about it. So from what you've just said there, Alistair, if, if there's a relative better performance in the UK for tax revenues that they take, then the Scottish budget gets hammered. That, that's the way the block grant adjustment was. So yes. No matter what Scotland does in terms of its performance and economic performance, if it's outpaced by performance in the rest of the UK, then our budget takes a hammering. That's the way the fiscal framework works, that the, the, the block grant adjustment yes. looks at the growth of UK tax revenue after 2016-17, and the, the, the in Scottish income tax revenue is the growth of Scottish income tax revenue after 2016-17. If UK income tax revenue grows faster than Scottish income tax revenue, then... Uh, then that's, uh, that's a problem for the Scottish Government. That's, uh, that's what devolution is about. Devolution is a means that Scottish income tax revenue depends on the performance of the Scottish economy, not on Scotland getting a share of UK income tax revenue. Well, actually, it's, it's more than that, though, isn't it? It's about a competition between the rest of the UK and Scotland, not just about how the Scottish economy is doing. Mm -hmm. And there's the fundamental problem. Anyway, that's a statement. I'm, I'm, and I, and I, I, I see Professor Smith is not responding to it because it's a political point. Uh, Alexander, is t sorry, I, I, I do apologise, Wally. I was going to move on. Apologies. It was leading me into the forecasting, the black art of forecasting. Um, I think it might be fair to say that you guys are on the pessimistic side of the forecasting uh, business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not wanting to, to start a spat with Tony Mackay's paper that I'm sure you've read, he, he says that your estimates are always on the pessimistic side. He looked at the GDP forecast, for example, which he says since December to now you've downgraded your GDP forecast by a third. So in December you were forecasting 1.2% and now it's 0.8%. So could I ask you... What's, what's responsible, in your view, for that quite marked downgrading in GDP forecast? And how reliable are your estimates? And can we, can we have any confidence that they're accurate going forward? I, I think there are a number of issues um, to, around what Professor Mackay says, but I think I'll just lay out a couple of them. The first thing is that we've, we made four forecasts. That's... Um, not a lot of forecasts, um, certainly not as many as Professor Mackay has made. Um, and also, we, we, we don't have much outturn data yet. And what we also know is that, particularly with national accounts, they're revised for some time. So I think it's fair to say that the jury is still out on our, our forecasting record. Every year in September, we, we do look at our forecasting record, and we produced a very comprehensive account of um, how our forecasts um, weren't weren't in line with the outturn data, as we thought it was at that time, um, last September, and we'll do the same in September. So um, we do take forecast evaluation seriously, and I don't think we've had in, made enough forecasts or had enough real data back yet to judge whether we're pessimistic or optimistic, um, or judge our forecasting record. It's also, I think, just turning to, this, to the, the forecast we've just made and, and, and pessimism, um, I think it's probably useful to note that both PricewaterhouseCooper and the phrase of Aranda also have revised their, their forecast for 2019 down, both by 0.3 percentage points. So that everyone is revising their forecast down. Yes. Yeah. You asked um, why our forecast had, had been revised down. I shall now try and give you a bit of an explanation of that. The last two years have been a particularly strong couple of years for the Scottish economy. Um, that's in main driven by um, very strong net trade performance. In part, that's driven by um, the depreciation of sterling. So we have two good years for the Scottish economy when the Scottish economy is operating above capacity. Now, an economy can't 
operate above capacity forever, so you would anticipate that growth would come down. And it certainly, we anticipate it does. The other thing that's happening, as you know, since the OBR issued its forecast about three months ago, Brexit has moved on. There's an awful lot more uncertainty about Brexit than there was. Um, we've more data on business investment, and that's looking weaker. Um, we also know that consumption is relatively soft. So we, we know that Brexit uncertainty is having a strong impact over the next couple of years. The other thing that's going on is, is around net trade. And I said before that the strong performance in the past two years has been particularly down to a very strong net trade performance. Now, it looks like the prospects for net trade over the next two years are much, much weaker. In part, that's Brexit. In part, though, it's the world economy. Um, I think the big international forecasting organizations are forecasting that the world economy will be weaker. Um, there was, a, I think the IMF produced a forecast yesterday. Um, certainly we have OECD and World Bank forecasts which are showing similar sorts of things. So the world economy is less strong. Yep. You see the potential trade wars um, that the US are embarking upon, so between China and the US and potentially the EU and the US. So the prospects for the world economy um, are not as good as they were. And also, you know, the weakness of sterling is now built in. So it's that. So I think the reasons for our downward revision are around Brexit and net trade. Okay. Thank you. Now, I, I know, Angela, you want to come in on Brexit, but, but I did say to Alexander I would let him in next, so I've done that twice to him. So I better let him in at this stage. Uh, thank you, Kavita. Um, I think one thing we do all understand is the forecasts haven't made pretty reading. Um, you know, there's been a lot of casting around for causes and a number of people uh, pointing at population you know, and, the, and more specifically Brexit. Uh, now, population is obviously a combination of you know, birth rates, mortality rates, people leaving and inward migration. Uh, but the net UK inward migration uh, numbers remain steady, even though EU nationals being replaced by non-EU. And so the question is, you know, even if we stayed in the EU single market, you know, would this completely close the growth gap between the UK and Scotland? Um, you're the expert. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure anyone's really an expert in, on, on population issues. Um, we do think that, that, bre that, that the sensitivity of... Um, of population of migration to Brexit issues is is a, a key element because um, quite a lot of the difference between the Scottish economy and the UK economy um, is, arises from the fact that the Scottish population, especially Scottish working age population, is growing relatively slowly compared to the rest the rest of the UK. Uh, but that's a you know, that's inevitably a big a big uncertainty and is, is one of the main channels through which we would expect Brexit, however it turns out, to to affect the economy. So if, if the Brexit outcome is one that is uh, that makes migration into Scotland uh, relatively unattractive or difficult, then that will have quite significant economic impact. But you know, if, if you're saying that the solution is to increase our population through inward migration, you know, isn't the logic of that that we're just going to further damage our productivity numbers, which are already... Uh, forecasting as being slow in growth. Yeah, you know, it isn't the real issue here uh, of all this. Uh, you know, we're simply not creating you know, the, r the right skills base here at home. Well, obviously, creating the right skills base at home is, is a good thing and one that any economy wants to keep its eye on. But uh, generally speaking, uh, inward migration from the rest of the EU has been positive for productivity and positive for the skills, skills base because uh, we in Scotland and in the UK in general uh, have benefited from inward migration of a relatively skilled labour force. Now, of, obviously, it's, that's not a recipe for saying then, then we don't need to worry about the skills of native-born native Scots. Of course we do. Italy, we've had you know, politicians saying you know, we should be attracting high-skilled workers from around the world, you know, specifically GPs. You know, are you aware of any countries having such a surplus of such people uh, to satisfy our own failings of creating those, those skills here? Uh, that, that's, a, that's an element of speculation that takes us too far outside the, the, the scope of the Fiscal Commission, I think.
Okay. Thank you, Convener. Angela. Convener, uh, good morning to, to the panel. Um, Lady Rice, in her opening remarks, said that uh, the Fiscal Commission's Brexit assumptions were, I quote, uh, a reasonable basis for forecasts. Um, why, why does the panel consider the Brexit assumptions to be reasonable? Uh, sort of in general, and I'll, uh, actually I'll turn again to Alistair, who does have a particular focus on, on these matters, but um, we look at a number of different um, f factors. Uh, you know, we don't just say, it's, it's not a binary, this or that. We look at a number of different factors, um, but we start with a base of saying that there will be some sort of orderly exit um, from Europe. We don't have evidence at this point to say there won't be an orderly exit, uh, but we do look at a number of different factors that draw out of that uh, orderly exit. It isn't uh, just A or B, there are a number of different implications. Uh, and um, even with the uncertainty that we have, and certainly uncertainty has, has increased, we feel that, um, that that starting point in our forecasts is still the right one at this point in time, or point in time when the forecast was completed. Okay. So, uh, but Alistair, you may have uh, more detail. Yeah. Carry on if you had a supplementary to that now. Oh, I do, but I'd like to hear why you think um, the Brexit assumptions are reasonable as uh, Lady well, Rice opened the floor our, to you. Our, our, our previous forecast was based on the assumption there would be an orderly exit in March of this year. Um, that, that was... Uh, a, that was a reasonable assumption at the time. It was what the, go the UK government was aiming for. It's what was by and large expected. It didn't happen. Um, I think anybody looking at the, the, the UK scene now would say that the, the probability of an orderly exit has gone down because uh, there are now a number of politicians uh, vying for an important position in the UK government, uh, who seem to be willing to contemplate a, a, a no-deal Brexit. So I think any reasonable person would say that the probability of a no-deal Brexit has gone up. But our judgment still would be that that's not the likeliest outcome. There isn't a majority in the UK Parliament for a no-deal Brexit. Um, and. So, you, so our central assumption remains uh, an orderly exit at some point. But as Susan said, um, th this is a broad brush estimate. And if the outturn turned out differently, for example, a further extension uh, granted by the EU, or uh, a decision to hold a, a, a referendum, a further referendum on, on Brexit, um, then that would have economic consequences that are broadly in, in the range that, we're, that would fit in within our broad, brace, our broad brush assumptions. As Susan said, the one outcome that does not fit within our broad brush, brush assumptions is uh, a, a no-deal Brexit because it would have very substantial economic consequences that aren't in our forecast, and therefore that is, as Susan said, a substantial risk to our forecast. But we still think that the range of outcomes that are compatible with our forecast, that I've just outlined, are more taken together more likely than a no-deal Brexit. Okay. Um, given that you've said that the probability of an orderly Brexit has decreased, and that a no deal Brexit or the, the, or the risk of a no deal Brexit has increased and a no deal Brexit is, as you acknowledge, a risk to your um, forecasts. So why then in paragraph 39 of your report when you say your forecasts are robust to a range of possibilities but actually what's in your report is based on one scenario um, given that, you know, Disney appear to be a consensus in the Westminster Parliament for anything, so it's quite difficult to point to hard um, and fast evidence. Um, I would be interested to know what work the Fiscal Commission has done about 
various possibilities about various scenarios regarding Brexit? We think that that the the, the assumptions in our in our scenario uh, are broad brush enough so that they, as I said earlier, would be appropriate for any any of the the non no deal Brexit outcomes. Um, and if if you were to f just for example ask us. What would be the consequences of a further delay, or what would the consequences be of there being a, a, a second referendum whose outcome would be unknown for a bit of time? Then that's sufficiently similar to the situation that we're currently in, that at the level that we're looking at of macroeconomic forecasting, it would not uh, make a very substantial difference to us. So we haven't, we've been content with the, the broad brush approach that has built into our current forecast. What we have done, some thinking about, is because clearly a couple of months ago we had to think seriously about would a no deal Brexit be our central assumption. Uh, we decided rightly, I think, as it turned out so far, that that would be not an appropriate assumption to make at that time. And we've thought about the issues that would go into a different forecast if we had to make a different forecast based on a no-deal Brexit. So there would be different assumptions about business investment, different assumptions about migration. There would be uh, assumptions about the economic effects in those sectors of the Scottish economy, like agriculture, that would probably be pretty severely affected by uh, a no-deal Brexit. And those those effect, those sectoral effects would be big enough to have an effect on the overall forecast. So, of course, we've done some preliminary thinking about what would be the issues that go into an alternative scenario, but we haven't, we didn't uh, and, and don't produce alternative forecasts, but we, but if, if the situation changed and it was, uh, the, there was a, a new fiscal event at which we had to produce a new forecast based on a no deal Brexit, then we have done some preliminary thinking about how we would go about doing that. So there are a number of factors that go into our thinking around Brexit. Alistair's just mentioned a couple of productivity, foreign direct investment, trade, migration, currency, and so forth. And we look at those factors. In a few cases, we've done some sensitivity analysis, factor by factor. Um, so that provides a little bit of background and something for people to chew over, as it were. But we don't produce um, alternative scenarios and alternative forecasts for a um, situation like that? Um, so, yeah, no, I, 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 if I've heard you correct, I understand what you've said about another set of work that's all broad brush um, and that it's all based on a non no deal scenario. Um, but you don't need to be much of a, a political scientist or an economist uh, or a professor to you know, look around you and see that the political situation is fluid. And I'm not asking you to comment on the political situation. Um, but what work around a no deal scenario or indeed other permeations, you know, are you in a position to share, bearing in mind that Mr Ireland uh, articulated very well um, earlier, you know, impacts on business investment, trade, uh, migration, you know, pr productivity. Well, as, as Susan said, it's not our job to produce alternative scenarios. We, we base our forecast on what seems to us to be the appropriate scenario at any, uh, in any given forecast. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we don't have a no-deal Brexit scenario hidden away. But as I said, we have done quite a bit of serious thinking about what would go into, into that. And I've already said um, among the key features would be effects on migration, effects on investment, and effects on particular sectors uh, of the Scottish economy. But it's also worth thinking about the fact that uh, if we did get into a no-deal scenario, then that's a situation in which uh, UK fiscal and monetary policy would probably be adjusted pretty quickly to 
address the consequences of it. So the, uh, the UK government would be looking at whether there was an appropriate fiscal changes. The Bank of England would be looking at monetary policy. Uh, it wouldn't even be sensible for us to, to jump in uh, I mean, we, we only produce forecasts when we're required for fiscal events. It would be sensible in any case to wait until we were clear what the fiscal and monetary framework was in which our, our no-deal scenario forecast was being done. Okay, so we might be waiting a while for some uh, clarity. My final question, um, convener, is that... Uh, again, in your report, you, paragraph 37, said that, you know, uh, although there was um, a period uh, of nearly two years of sustained above average growth, you know, nonetheless, because of Brexit, um, you've had to revise uh, down uh, your outlook as opposed to up. If it hadn't been for Brexit, you'd have been revising uh, up your outlook. That's what it says here. All else equal, this nearly two-year period of sustained above-average growth might have led us to have revised up our outlook for the economy. However, uh, we expect the ongoing uncertainty created by Brexit negotiation process will limit growth. Um, so my, my final question is that if it wasn't uh, for Brexit, uh, what would your forecast have been for growth in Scotland? <laughs> you're, you're inviting me to describe an alternative scenario which we haven't, um, which uh, we haven't produced, uh, and don't and don't normal business, <laughs> <laughs> and don't produce. Uh, but but actually, the it's for the reasons which John explained earlier. Um, Brexit uncertainty is one of the factors that have led us to downgrade the economy forecast, in spite of relatively strong performance in, over the last two years, but it's by no means the only one. The, the, the most significant Brexit effect is an assumption that Brexit will um, have a negative effect on investment growth. But actually, the single biggest effect on bringing the rate of economic growth down, as John talked about earlier, is the assumption uh, that the depreciation of sterling, which has driven strong trade performance for the last two years has now happened and it's, yeah. you know, it's baked in and we cannot expect continued strong trade performance improvement. And that's actually uh, a, a bigger impact on bringing us down from 1.3 to 0 0.8 than the Brexit effect. So the words about Brexit that you just quoted are words about part of what is part of the negative effect in our relatively subdued forecast, but it's not the whole story. Okay, thanks, got, I think I've got a couple of supplementaries on the Brexit question. Am I right in saying that before? I'll come back to you on the public sector one, Emma, and then I think Murdo's got a supplementary as well. So, Emma, when you go on the yep. supplementary. I mean, I'm picking up from Angela Constance about forecasting based on tighter immigration policies that might be set by the UK. We're already seeing the number of nurses registering and midwives on the NMC reduced by... Um, there's been an increase of people leaving. 4,000 people have left. That's an increase of 29%. We're seeing the fewer people registering on, on the Nursing and Midwifery Council, and we know the impact of agriculture if we have a tighter immigration regime, whether it's seasonal agricultural fruit pickers or the all-year-round dairy workforce. So I am curious why there isn't a forecast that's much more um, succinct about the specific immigration impact on Scotland with a, a, a tighter immigration regime? Well, our, our, our current forecast does assume uh, that there will be less migration than we have seen in the past. Um, so there is, the, there is some reduction in, in migration built in because we already see that in the numbers. And as you say, these numbers are not, not just numbers. We see the effects in particular sectors that are uh, that that have a, a, a lot of migrant workers, like health services, health and social care, health and social care, and, and agriculture. Um, but the big effect on 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 migration would come if we were looking at a no deal Brexit scenario. Then I think the, the there would be sectoral effects that would be so big that we would be thinking through whether there are you know, how they feed through to the macroeconomic forecast. So at the moment, 
uh, some reductions in migration are built into a forecast, and we think at an appropriate level. Um, earlier, Susan said that we produced um, sensitivity analysis of our, of our forecast, and in Table 2.7, um, there's actually um, a set of variants around different migration assumptions. So if you want to build your own forecast, you can have a look at Table 2.7, and that gives you a sense of the impact on GDP, employment, and average earnings of um, high and low variants of migration. Okay, murdo has got a supplementary, I think, in this area as well. I'll come uh, back to you, Emma, on your other question. Yeah. And, and I'll come back to you and Murdo on the other issue you want to raise as well. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. First of all, my, my apologies to the Commissioners. I was at uh, another committee meeting this morning moving amendments to the Transport Bill, so I missed the earlier part of, of your evidence. But I had a follow-up to Angela Constant's uh, questions on, on Brexit, and I, I absolutely understand everything you said to her about uh, not providing alternative scenarios. Um, but I'm going to have a go anyway. Um, let's, let's, let, 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 let's, let's just assume hypothetically um, Brexit gets called off. Right? Yeah, that's it. You know, we're staying in the EU, we're staying in the single market. In that event, would you expect Scottish economic growth over the next three, four years to match UK economic growth? Or is there, is there more to it than that? Um, I, I, I think the... Uh, thank you very much for the warning that you were going to ask a question that would tempt us to, 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 to talk outside a brief. I, I, I th but I think the honest answer to that question is, is we don't know. It's not something that we've thought about. Brexit being cancelled, we think, would, to go back to my response to Ms. Constance, is not so far away from our broad brush orderly <coughs> Brexit scenario that, that we'd regard that as something that would generate very dramatic effects, especially in the short run, uh, because there would, you know, there'd be lots of un there would be uncertainty effects associated with Brexit being cancelled uh, that might well have negative economic impacts. But the relative performance of Scotland and the rest of the UK in a no Brexit scenario, very very hard to, to speculate about, even if it was our business to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Emma, you've got another question. Yeah, it might even be a good news question, actually. Um, I'm interested in public sector pay, and um, we've heard about higher uh, rate taxpayers this morning, but we know that public sector pay has been increasing in Scotland, and obviously um, most of us, if not all of us, uh, would like to see uh, earnings continue to increase in Scotland across both public and private sectors. So, um, for instance, if uh, every additional pound in earnings... Uh, occurred, what would be the forecast or what would you expect to be the return in tax revenue on that? Don't construct that sort of ready director. Um, so uh, what I can say is that the public sector pay policy of, of the government is built into our forecasts. Um, and as you say, that sort of the generosity of that public pay has increased over time, and that's reflected in our forecasts. But we, we don't build those sort of ready rectors where you can say, if you increase public sector pay, then you get a pound more income tax or 50p more income tax. That's not, not our job. So last week I raised a question in chamber about the possible increases in public sector spend as a result of processes that might should have been followed um, following the £1 billion spending decision that Westminster made. So, and in response to that, if, if a barnetised approach might have been um, placed on that, we in Scotland would have had an increase in £3 billion to uh, our spending. So that would mean that we would have an extra £750 million come to Scotland. Would, would that have been something, obviously, that we should have been arguing for? You see, you, you've, you've struck us speechless. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, that is just hard for us to um, respond to. That's your call, not our call, for what you should be. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it's a feature of the devolved system, yeah. the Barnett formula, that the Scottish Block Grant uh, responds to, to spending decisions in the rest of the UK. But... As Susan said, it's not for us to advocate one thing or another. Okay. Neil. If I may just go back to the Brexit issue just quickly. Is that? Just, um, it was, you, said, you, just, you said that the biggest factor was on investment. 
um, in terms of the Brexit uncertainty was affecting investment. Is the Brexit uncertainty affecting investment in Scotland more than the rest of the UK, or is it the same? I don't think it's particularly a Scotland only effect. There is an effect in, 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 the, in the UK as a whole. Uh, I, I, I don't know about the Scotland UK comparison. I, I don't know either. I do know that the OBR have marked down their business investment forecast too. It is really important to say that the business investment data, both in the UK and Scotland, is really poor. So though it's shown quite dramatic reductions recently, um, it's it's quite hard to judge relative performance. So that's another issue. Um. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Mardo. Thank, thank you, Convener. Um, this, is, this is really just a, a process question. Um, last week, the uh, Finance Secretary delivered to Parliament the uh, medium-term financial statement. Uh, and he reported to Parliament on a number of aspects of, of what was in your uh, report. Um, but in his statement to Parliament, he only made very tangential reference to a number of aspects in your report, including an issue that has taken up a lot of time this morning, talking about the income tax reconciliation and the potential £1 billion plus reduction in the money available in the public finances, which you know, subsequently became clear was a major talking point, as indeed it has been uh, this morning. And that information was not made available at that time to uh, opposition party uh, spokespeople or indeed other members who were asking questions of the Cabinet Secretary, because uh, your report was not published until after the session had taken place in Parliament. And it occurred to me at, you know, at the time, and, and I think this might be reflected in the views of other members too, that um, to have a very partial uh, explanation from the Cabinet Secretary of, of the situation didn't allow the fullest opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny. And I understand that the release of data between, uh, is, is, uh, your data is, is agreed in a memorandum between the Scottish Government and uh, the Fiscal Commission. And I don't expect you to answer this immediately, but I wonder whether you might want to go away and reflect upon the timing of release of data to Parliament and whether in future it might be helpful if in advance of a statement like that being made, opposition members might be made uh, available of, uh, made, made, the, the more facts might be made available to opposition members, particularly you know when there are key issues that need to be highlighted, which are not covered in the Finance Secretary's statement. So you're, you're correct that um, the, the way we interact with the government is laid out in an agreed and public protocol for those interactions and, and we've always been very uh, transparent about that and we kind of follow what's in the protocol but protocols can be looked at and reconsidered and uh, indeed the, the first uh, edition of that did change about a year later once we felt our way through it, not a around the factors that you're talking about but just in terms of timings of exchanges. So I think um, I could say on behalf of the Commission that we were happy to at least look at, I'm not making promises about changes, but we would certainly um, look at the timing of when we lay our report before Parliament, which is what I think you're, you're talking about. So uh, we'll take that away and um, consider that. Yeah. Could I add that the, the protocol is due to be revised this summer um, and Certainly when we did the last set of revisions, we, we spoke to Jim about that and we'll also have a conversation with Jim over the summer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad Mud asked that question because it's not just opposition members, it's, no. obviously it's the whole of Parliament who, 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 are, who are considering here in terms of the information available to us so we can ask proper questions of the Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank our witnesses to the, the, the meeting this morning? It's a, been a, an interesting and probably lengthier session we've had in the past, but. Uh, and a lot of information has been exchanged. And at this stage, I, I now close this public part of the meeting. So thank you very much.